In this programme, we look at the steam locomotives of the London, Midland and Scottish Railways, or LMS, the largest of the four private companies that was nationalised in 1948 to form British Railways. Appropriately for the largest company, it had the largest and most powerful express passenger locomotives, Sir William Stanier's Duchesses, one of which, 46229 Duchess of Hamilton, is owned by the National Railway Museum at York. It works today over former LMS lines, including the celebrated Settle and Carlisle, as seen here. We'll start with the Scottish part of the LMS title, with some of the smallest locomotives which survived until the 1950s. The Highland Railway's small 044 tanks retained until 1956 to work the Dormouth branch of the Highlands north of Inverness. Originally there were four of these typically Scottish outline tanks, but only two remained during BR days. They were based at Helmsdale Show and were replaced by Great Western Pannier tanks. The only other Highland Railway survivor in the mid-50s was Ben Alder, retained for preservation but sadly scrapped after 12 years at Wick in store. Other Scottish locomotives working in the Highlands included Caledonian Railway 440s, designed by Pickerskill. The 3P on the cab side illustrates the LMS power classification as adopted and expanded by British Railways. The number indicates the power and the letters P for passenger or F for freight indicate the type of work the locomotive is required to do. These Scottish 440s were passenger locomotives and had been the principal express engines of the Caledonian Railway when it was amalgamated into the LMS in 1923. By the 1950s, they were used on local passenger services throughout the former LMS Scottish system. The Caledonian's principal freight engines were compact 060s, this was the common Victorian freight design, as, having no trailing wheels, all the weight was concentrated on the driving wheels for maximum addition and braking capacity. These locomotives were known as jumbos and consisted of three basic classes, each an updated enlargement of the other. For local passenger work, the Caledonian employed large 044 tanks, one of which is seen on the main line near Perth with two restored Caledonian coaches. These were known as Grampian stock and had been restored to their original livery to work with preserved Caledonian Express engine number 123, which is seen here at the head of an enthusiast excursion in the late 1950s with one of the 044 tanks banking at the rear. This locomotive was a one-off oddity. It only had one pair of driving wheels and was built in 1886 for exhibition purposes, subsequently being sold to the Caledonian Railway. It survives today in Glasgow Museum, displaying the magnificent Caledonian blue livery, as does the sole surviving 044 tank, which works on the Scottish Railway Preservation Society's railway at Bowness, on the banks of the River Forth. Currently, this is the only working ex-LMS Scottish locomotive, although one of the Jumbo 060s is under restoration at Aviemore in the Highlands. The railway is known as the Forth Valley Railway, and operates throughout the tourist seasons, serving a mining museum at Burkhill, where the tank enters the station. O 
only one engine of the third Scottish Railway's constituent of the LMS, the Glasgow and South Western Railway, survived into British Railway's days, but six from the first of the English constituents, the Furness Railway, did. These were all 060 tender engines, three of which were in their original form, as seen here, and three of which had been re-equipped with Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway boilers, as seen on number 52510 on a rail tour to commemorate the class's last work in 1957. These locomotives were a curious blend of practice and at first glance could be assumed to be normal Lancashire and Yorkshire engines. The most obvious difference was in the tenders. Both the L&Y and the Furness served Carnforth. And it's at the preservation centre there that we see a genuine Lancashire and Yorkshire 060. Other differences include sandboxes and the cab spectacle plates. Some Lancashire and Yorkshire 060s were rebuilt as saddle tanks, three of which survived until 1963 as work shunters with their original LMS numbers at the Lancashire and Yorkshire's locomotive works at Horwich. One has been preserved, as has one of the railway's characteristic 242 tanks used for local passenger duties. This engine still displayed its LMS livery in 1953. The 242 layout was popular with the LMS constituent company. With a symmetrical wheel layout, they were equally suitable for running in either direction and were employed for motor train work. This was the system by which a locomotive was semi-permanently attached to its train and by a system of pulleys, levers and air pipes could be controlled from a remote location in a specially fitted driving trailer coach. The London and North Western Railway also contributed 242 tanks to LMS stock. 43 out of 160 built between 1890 and 1897 survived into British Railways ownership. They didn't last long, all having been replaced by the new British Railways Standard Class 2 262 tanks by 1955. The final working areas of these characteristically obsolete looking Victorian engines, with their massive domes and very tall chimneys, were in North Wales and around the Birmingham suburbs where we see some of the final survivors at work on motor train workings in 1953. The locomotive's outline was a crew trademark, the product of the autocratic Francis Webb, who ruled the LNWR's locomotive affairs with all the vigour of a true Victorian. All his locomotives looked similar, whether tank or tender engines, his 060s being the only survivors of the latter. Two types passed into British Railway's hands, the smaller coal engines, and the later 18-inch goods, often known as cauliflowers. One of the latter is seen at Penrith, engaged on the last work for these engines, passenger duties on the Penrith, Keswick and Cockermouth Railway in the Lake District. They were, of course, freight engines. The LNWR's heavy freight engines were 080s. Many of these were rebuilds of Webb's 280 compounds. 502 engines of slightly varying dimensions were eventually built, and classified either 6F or 7F by the LMS. The earliest ones were the Webb rebuilds, but his successors, Whale, Bowen, Cook and Beams, each introduced variants of the type, which the LNWR designated classes G1, G2 and G2A. They were collectively known as Super Ds and worked the heavy mineral and freight traffic throughout the LNWR. With the complications of Webb's compounding removed, they were extremely simple, rugged machines became the final survivors of all LNWR locomotives, the last being withdrawn as late as 1964. Number 49395 has been preserved, as has the last survivor of his 062 coal tank engines, number 58926, which has been restored to operating condition as LNWR 1054, the only working ex-LNWR locomotive. Here it's seen on a visit to the Seven Valley Railway.
The LNWR had taken over the small North London Railway in 1909, and one of this line's 060 tanks has also been preserved on the Bluebell Railway. This engine is the only survivor of a class of 30 machines built between 1887 and 1905. When the LNWR took over the railway, it brought the little tank engine's profile into line with its own standards. The LMS transferred them to Derbyshire to work on the Cromford and High Peak Railway, the railway with the steepest adhesion work gradients in the British Isles, a far cry from working on London commuter trains. Rail tours over the high peak line in open wagons were very popular in the 1950s. Perhaps the epithet of cattle wagons for commuter trains applied equally here, but these were volunteers. Another London suburban railway system to be taken over by an LMS constituent was the London Tilbury and South End Railway, absorbed by the Midland Railway. The locomotives of this line also migrated northwards to Uppingham in the county of Rutland. They were Atlantic tanks, in other words, 442 tank engines. These last survivors have been built by the LMS. The Midland Railway's own standard local and branch passenger engines were 044 tanks, a number of which survived into nationalisation. Classified 1P, our first example still sports an ornate dome and condensing pipes alongside the boiler. As these engines had also worked on London suburban trains in their early days, working through the metropolitan tunnels, Many were motor fitted, and variations in the domes and fireboxes can be seen here. This engine has a bell pair firebox. They were built between 1881 and 1900, and there were originally 165 of them spread evenly across the system. One batch worked on the celebrated Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. The last one, number 58060, was scrapped in 1960. None survive. One of their freight equivalents, the 1F half cab 060 tanks, does, and is seen in the south of England on the Isle of Purbeck Railway. The next progression in Midland motive power is naturally the 2F. Theirs was a complicated history with many rebuildings and some reclassifications. The 5 foot 3 inch driving wheel type was the most numerous with 865 having been built between 1875 and 1902 to a design by S.W. Johnson. All originally had round top fireboxes, but the bell pair style eventually superseded these. By 1963, only three survived, number 581-48, seen here, succumbing during that year, with only 581-82 lasting into 1964, being taken out of traffic in January. About one half of the Class II engines were rebuilt with larger boilers and classified as 3F. In total, 387 3Fs came into British Railways' hands, of which the last 69 had been built new to that classification. Three of these saw in 1964, but none have been preserved. As with so many of the smaller freight engines, they saw out their days on passenger workings. The 3F classification also applied to the Midlands standard 060 shunting tank engines. These were further developed to become the LMS own standard shunters, the well-known Jinties. This is the Keithley and Worth Valley's example being turned on the old Midland railway turntable that once stood at Garsdale on the Settle and Carlisle Railway.
These tank engines were equally at home on local passenger duties, some being fitted with vacuum brakes and train heating for this purpose. Many have been preserved. This one normally resides on the Severn Valley Railway, but is seen here with Yuletide celebrants on the Swanage Line. One jinty has achieved express passenger status if one believes its livery. BR's version of the LMS livery looks very well on the Midland Railway Trust tank, although these engines never carried any livery except plain black throughout their service careers. The Midland Trust has been set up to preserve all and any artefacts pertaining to the Midland Railway and has restored a branch line in North Derbyshire based on the small town of Butterley. A large museum complex has been created at Swanage Junction where we see the Jinty leaving eastbound. Progressing up the freight power chart, we come to the Midland 4F design, another type which was adopted as an early LMS standard. The only difference of note was the change from right-hand to left-hand drive. This was part of a controversial period of LMS design practice, whereby four Midland designs were adopted as LMS standards and mass-produced, resulting in 772 of these 4F engines. Although the 4Fs were really obsolete before the LMS was created, the Midland had shown that it could produce an effective large freight engine when it introduced a special class 7F locomotive for the jointly owned Somerset and Dorset Railway. Eleven of these 280s were built, two of which survive today. This is 53809 of the series, which was built with a larger diameter boiler, but later rebuilt with the same Midland standard boiler as fitted to the 4Fs. It's another locomotive based on the Midland Trust line at Butterley, but is also passed to work on British Rail main lines as seen here. The Somerset and Dorset Railway is something of a legend in railway circles and a second 7F survives still in Somerset. The engine is 53808, owned by the Somerset and Dorset Railway Trust, although here it's working in disguise as its long scrap classmate, 
53807. This good strain illustrates the engine's real role. Midland also produced one solitary, very large locomotive for its own use. This was an 010 machine, which was effectively neither a passenger nor a freight engine, as it never hauled trains. Instead, it pushed them, as it was built specifically for banking trains up the notorious Licky Incline, up which the Midland's main line from Bristol to Birmingham ran just outside the latter city at Bromsgrove. Here, Big Bertha, as it was colloquially known, pushes an enthusiast rail tour up the incline. The Midlands' contributions to mainline passenger haulage consisted of two classes, both of which were perpetuated by the LMS. The principal class was the 2P440 type. As power classifications ran in the 0-7 range, it can be seen that these were comparatively puny machines. Nevertheless, the LMS continued production of them in its early days when the Midlands' design philosophy was dominant under Sir Henry Fowler. These 440s were part of the Midlands' policy of producing small engines for their frequent light trains. For both freight and passenger trains requiring greater power, the procedure was to simply double up the engines. This, however, was very expensive in maintenance and labour costs, especially on the former LNWR lines, which received stocks of these engines, where they'd previously had larger 460s. They also received the LMS version of the Midlands 4P 440s. These were more powerful than the 2Ps and had three cylinders employing the compound system of steam propulsion. This was a system whereby pressurized steam was used twice, initially at high pressure in the smaller outside cylinders and then again at reduced pressure in the single large inside cylinder. These compounds were the most successful British versions of their type but it was still far too small for the heavy duties on the LMS system. One survives number 1000, the first of the original Midland locomotives. Altogether, there were 140 of them, last being scrapped in 1961. By that time, of course, they were comparative rarities and in demand for rail tours. Their position as fine engines had never really been compromised. It was merely their size and the imposition of the Midland tradition on the other railways that had caused the stain on their reputation. There had been a brief period before the Midland ascendancy in LMS motive power circles at the very formation of the railway, when the chief mechanical engineer of the old Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, George Hughes, had held sway. He produced two large designs of modern six-coupled engines in the last years of the L and Y, and these were expanded as a first LMS standard. The two versions were large 464 tank engines and 460 tender engines. In total, 75 460s were built, but they weren't very successful, and this is the last one, scrapped in 1951. Hughes also designed a mixed traffic type of 260, or Mogul. These weren't put into service until after Sir Henry Fowler had taken over and were thus Midlandized before construction took place. The Midland compromisers included a very mismatched and narrow tender, but the large cab and peculiarly positioned cylinders were pure Hughes. The engines were commonly known as crabs, were by far and away the most successful of the early LMS types. 245 were built between 1926 and 1932, some lasting to nearly the very end of steam in 1967. Two have been preserved, but have not yet been restored to working order. This is in contrast to the Fowler 262 tanks, classified 3P, the last of which is seen here in 1962, and the 264 class 4P tanks, which lasted a little longer. These were rather more successful and were built between 1927 and 1934, the later ones being under the tutelage of Sir William Stanier, who saw sufficient good in them not to change the design. The parallel boiler was the standard X Midland design and the last ones went in 1966. Again, none have been preserved.
Stania eventually produced his own versions of both the 3P and 4P tanks. His 3P262s looked under-boilered and rather delicate with their small side tanks. They were as bad as the Fowler engines, although nearly twice as many were built between 1935 and 1938. Probably the worst of Stania's designs. None are preserved. A rather better design of small tank engine was produced by Stania's successor, H.G. Ivert. These were the Class II 262s, which were produced from 1946 as part of the LMS standardization scheme and were perpetuated by British Railways in its barely disguised 84,000 class tanks. Many were fitted with motor train equipment and were primarily designed to replace the many pre-grouping small passenger tanks which were getting very long in the tooth by the end of the war. 130 of these engines were built and withdrawal took place between 1962 and 1967. Several are preserved, including 41241 on the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway. tender version of the Class II was also produced for light duties over the longer secondary lines. These were built contemporaneously with the tanks from 1946 to 1952 and were also perpetuated by a British Railway's 78,000 class. 128 of these were built and six survive today, the most travelled being 46443, which normally resides on the Seven Valley Railway. Here it's on loan to the Llangothlin Railway and is seen leaving Deeside Halt. Langothlin Railway is one of Britain's expanding preserved railway network. Situated alongside the River Dee, it's planning to extend westwards into Wales along the route of the Old Great Western Line from Rwaban to the coast of Barmer. The railway's present plan is to extend westwards to Corn and later eastwards back to Rwaban. The design of the Ivert moguls was that of pure practicality. Aesthetics played no part in the layout of mechanical gear or practical features. They were an austerity design, which went against many of the traditional design parameters of earlier locomotive engineers. However, they were very efficient and economical, so can be judged a major success. Although the Clangothlin Railway cannot reach Barmouth, the small Ivert locomotive did in 1987. It was passed for working over British Rail's metals, and in that year was employed on a series of tourist trains along the Cambrian coast lines.
At the other end of the scale is the Stania 8F heavy freight locomotive. These were the LMS's standard goods engines to the end of its days, and 852 of them were produced, not all for the LMS. The design was adopted as a war department standard, and many were built by outside contractors, including each of the three other railways. This engine, seen at its home base of Carnforth in Lancashire, is one of the original LMS engines and is passed for running over BR tracks. During 1991, it was used on a series of workings around the Cumbrian coast from Carnforth Station via Grangeover Sands, Barrow in Furnace, and Ravenglass to the nuclear reprocessing plant at Sellafield. The 8F survived right to the very end of BR Steam in 1968. Carnforth was one of the handful of steam sheds which finally closed in August 1968. The 8Fs, having regularly hauled freight over the West Coast Main Line and the lines in the Northwest for over 30 years. These days were recreated in a somewhat surprising fashion in the south of England in 1988 when demonstration freights ran through Salisbury Station, headed by the 8F. mixed traffic development under Stania commenced with a small series of 260 moguls. These were effectively an updated version of the crabs and were really a holding exercise pending the introduction of a standard mixed traffic design. They were classified as class 5 and 40 were built. One survives on the Seven Valley Railway, number 2968. The real Stania mixed traffic design was the famous Black 5, two of which are seen on the Great Central Railway. This was a truly versatile type of locomotive, and in total, 842 were produced, only 10 less than the 8Fs, but all to LMS order. The first was produced in 1934, and building continued until 1951, when British Railways adapted the design and produced its own standard type, the 73,000 class 5s. Construction continued throughout the war, and many variations on the basic theme appeared after the war. These experimental locomotives were part of H.G. Ivert's post-war developments and were interspersed with the construction of the standard members of the class. These variations included double chimneys, caprotti valve gear, roller bearings and combinations of these features, as well as a unique Stevenson valve geared machine which is preserved today. These scenes of the class and its service days illustrate the wide diversity of traffic handled and the range of locations covered from the Great Central through the North Wales coast to Leeds, near which we see a freight train headed by one of the standard members of the class in 1965. And these engines too survived right to the very end of British Railway steam, large numbers of them working into 1968 on all kinds of traffic in the northwest, where they still work trains with 264 tanks as bankers over Shap. In their heyday, it was said they could be seen in all parts of the country, 
from Bournemouth, which they reached via the Somerset and Dorset Railway, to Wick, where they'd replaced the various small Scottish locomotive classes. It's in Scotland that we see our first preserved Black Five, one of the first batch to be delivered in 1934. This is 5025, built by the Vulcan foundry and delivered before the first crew-built examples. And it works today on the Strathspey Railway near Aviemore. This railway was once part of the Highland Railway's main line from Perth to Inverness and is one of only three ex-main lines to be preserved. Year, Scotland has been the place to see Black Fives. British Rail has promoted a summer series of steam workings over the West Highland Line from Fort William since 1985. 5305 Alderman A.E. Draper has been a regular performer here. One of the two Black Fives used on BR's last steam haul passenger train in regular service in 1968 was 44871, which has also been restored and used on West Highland Line services. These trains have worked on Sundays and on three or four weekdays from June to September, with additional runs outside these times. From 1989, BR have also promoted holiday steam trains along the North Wales coast, where 5407 was an early performer. This was one of the regular routes worked by Black Fives in their service days. As has been said, they worked throughout the ex-LMS system, and the preserved examples continue to do that. 5305 reached Bournemouth in 1988, and the same engine got as far as Helmsdale in 1985, not quite to Wick. This is the Midland Trust Black Five 44932 near its home in Derbyshire. The LNWR had left the LMS with something of a crisis in express passenger power. Its top-line locomotives were four-cylinder 460s of a relatively poor design, the Clortons. The Patriots, one of which is seen in the Loon Valley, were nominally rebuilt Clortons, although in reality a new type of engine using an enlarged Clorton boiler on a Royal Scot chassis. The latter was the first large modern express passenger design for the LMS, introduced in 1927. It sported a somewhat old-fashioned looking boiler, which was later replaced by the type of boiler seen here, in which form the engines were considered to be the best British 460 type ever. There were 70 of them, this final outline having been designed by Sir William Stanier. In 1948, the new British Railways organised a sort of competition between locomotives of the various railways which had formed British Railways. Royal Scots were tested against many much larger and apparently more modern designs, and proved themselves markedly superior to such illustrious opposition as the Great Western Kings, which were on paper at least supposed to be at least 20% more powerful. Two Scots survived, one Royal Scot herself at Bressingham Museum in Norfolk, and Scots Guardsman, which was to be restored to mainline condition in the early 1990s. Stanier's own design of three-cylindered 460 for express duties was the Jubilee class. This was a development of both the Patriots and original Scots with a Stanier boiler, smaller than the rebuilt Scots. Two are seen in their last in-service days on the Settle and Carlisle route, 
with one of the end of steam specials run by British Rail. Both found their way into preservation and we next see the second of the pair, Bahamas, again at work on a train heading to Settle and Carlisle. This engine was one of a few of the Jubilees to have a large double exhaust chimney, which makes it different to the other two members of the class which have been preserved. Apparently the double chimney made little difference to the locomotive's performance, which had a chequered history, starting badly, but with modifications eventually being very good. This was a hot day, although there was little exhaust smoke to be seen, the engine set off numerous line-side fires. The leading engine of the pair we saw earlier was Collipur, which is painted in the original LMS maroon livery of the 1930s, and is seen working on the preserved Great Central Railway. Express passenger power didn't come to the LMS until the early 1930s, when Sir William Stanier produced the first of the two types of Pacific locomotives. His first design was the Princess class, two of which were built in 1933. These were massive engines, the largest normal type of steam engine ever produced in Great Britain, and were named the Princess Royal and Princess Elizabeth, respectively. The second of these engines, which set a series of records over the London to Glasgow route in 1936, was preserved. It's seen working over one of LMS's main lines from Valley towards Crewe on British Rail's Northwest Coast Express. These trains have been promoted by British Rail as tourist runs along the Holiday Town coastal belt and have included a run down the branch line to Clandidno, the largest of the town. Here the princess is returning to the main line. The locomotive is owned by a preservation society based at Hereford has run throughout that part of the BR system which is approved for steam, with the exception of the Scottish routes. Here she heads out onto the North Wales coast again. One part of the British Rail network that was under threat of closure for some time was the line from Blackburn to Hellifield, which connects with the Settle and Carlisle, also under a closure cloud. Both were reprieved and form the most spectacular steam route available today.
At Appleby on the Settle and Carlisle, an event took place in 1991, the meeting of the two royal sisters, Princess Elizabeth and Margaret Rose. Named after the two daughters of King George VI, it's a happy coincidence that the second preserved Princess Pacific is 46203, the first of an additional ten locomotives produced to the first Tanya design. This engine joined its sister on the main lines in 1990, owing its existence to Sir Billy Butlin, who bought it from British Rail in the 1960s for display at one of his holiday camps in North Wales. Another locomotive which owes its preservation to Sir Billy Butlin is Duchess of Hamilton. This engine is now owned by the National Railway Museum at York and is frequently to be seen in action. This is one of Sir William Stanier's second Express Pacific design and was to prove to be the largest and most powerful passenger design to work in Britain. The earliest members of the class had streamlined casing when built and the first engine, Coronation, briefly held the world steam speed record before Mallard of the LNER took it for all time. The Duchess has on many occasions been seen on the Settle and Carlisle route as here when she's approaching Hellifield Junction for the line to Blackburn. Finally, we see the Duchess high in the Pennines, having just crossed the celebrated Ribblehead Viaduct. 37 of these engines were built, giving the LMS a total of only 50 top-line Express Pacifics. There were 13 Princesses and one experimental turbine-driven engine. This was in contrast to the LNER, its East Coast rival, which had pursued a big engine policy from its inception and had an ample stock of mainline power and also the Southern Railway, which had 140 Pacifics, for a railway which was much smaller and had pursued an electrification policy. However, as we've seen, the LMS had produced a major standard range of engines in its last years, and this was to be continued under British Railways, as LMS men took over the high positions in the nationalised concern.